to the relationship series, guys. Are you excited for this? From a level of one to 10, how uncomfortable are you? 10? 11? Guys, whew. Wow, guys, that, I was wondering, we were taking bets, we didn't know how uncomfortable people would be, and actually we had someone in our office who was like, why are you playing driver's license? And we're like, uh, no, no, no reason. And so people have been wondering all week when they're around the office, like, why are you playing this song? Now you know. So here's the deal. We are launching into this relationship series, and I thought a little comedic relief would be good because there will be times that we're serious. There'll be some times that we, we do laugh. There'll be some times where we talk about topics that is like taboo in the church world, right? Like there's certain things in the church that we struggle to talk about. And if I've been this person, I am sorry, forgive me, but these are some things that we don't talk about. We don't talk about spiritual warfare a lot. So angels, demons, demonic possession, Satan, all this stuff. Like we don't talk about that a lot. Oh, don't you dare talk about my money, right? People don't like when we talk about money and God's resources that he's given us to be stewards of. And another thing is relationships and, and sex and dating and, and all the topics that, that God talks about in his word. But we see in the word of God that, that it is so different than what the world says relationships should look like, right? Like some of us, um, I, I found this this week, it, it's like a walk in the park, but if we're honest with ourselves, our relationships are more like a walk in Jurassic Park, okay? Like our relationships are, are bad. And I would love to say, I would love to say that within the church, our relationships are better than outside the church. I would love to say that because someone is connected within our youth group, that it looks so different than the world's relationship. I'd love to say that, but if I'm completely honest, that's not the case. We might have some isolated relationships, but, but overall, most relationships within the church look very similar to a relationship that's outside the church. And what I mean by that is within the church, outside the church, is those who claim to be followers of Jesus and then choose to be in a dating relationship. Then those who are outside the church, people who they don't really have a relationship with God or they're not connected with the church, and then they choose to date. And, and those relationships are, are almost exactly the same. And, and it's so easy for us as Christians to say, you know what, it, it's just what it is. And, and we accept it, and these are things that happen within a relationship. And I just completely disagree with that. And, and I always will. Not because I've been perfect in the dating world, but because I've seen the damage that carries. A lot of people say this. This is the biggest lie of Satan, the biggest lie in relationships, that if I mess up now, it won't carry with me later. It won't affect my future. And that's just not true. What we do now, the decisions we make now, the relationships we have now, could affect us for a lifetime. And so I would rather talk about them and get honest with you and be uncomfortable with you. If you're a guest, welcome to Eastside. <laughs> We're so happy you're here. Um, I have made a couple of them uncomfortable. I will not point at any of them who are here for the first time. No, I'm joking. Okay, but, but here's the deal. I hope, I hope, I hope that when people think of Eastside Student Ministry, they think of a place that you can find truth and love. Where, where there is love, that we are, we are accepted, we are hugged, we are comforted, but also there's this other side where there is truth. And we don't just get super fluffy, there is actually truth. And so this is one of those topics that we have to get very truthful on. And so that's why we called it Dating Delilah. It's actually off of a book by a pastor named Judas Smith. And so we, we grabbed that title from his book. And if you know anything about Samson, Samson was a judge in the Old Testament. We're going to be talking through some scripture here in a little bit. And, and he ended up dating and, and being with a girl named Delilah. And it ended up being a huge downfall in, in him as a person, him and his faith. 
And so we're going to be talking about that. We all have struggles with our own Delilahs in our life. And so I want to talk before we go into scripture about a situation when I wanted something so bad. And it actually was an Xbox 360. Okay? Yes, most of you were not born. Okay? So an Xbox 360, I wanted one so bad. I was a junior in high school. And my friend waited outside of a Target for like 24 hours. He camped out in the cold because he wanted to get an Xbox. And and I just didn't have the money to purchase an Xbox in the beginning because people would purchase them and then sell them for double the cost. And so I had to wait a year or two until the prices went down. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to go on Craigslist and I'm going to find a used Xbox 360. So I saved up. I worked at this place called Pomida, which was like a poor man's Kmart. Yes, it was, it was rough, guys. It was very rough. But I worked there. I made $7.50 an hour, okay? And I worked there. I was saving up. I did landscaping with my dad on the side. And I was like, okay, I'm going to save up a couple hundred dollars. I'm going to go get an Xbox. And I found a deal for an Xbox, $200, and it was about an hour and a half away. So I got my little car, my Ford Focus. It was a ZX3. I had tinted windows, 12-inch woofers in the trunk, and I thought I was so cool. I even had a little touchscreen, and, and I thought I was awesome. This is when I had my fitted hats, my pierced earrings, and I only wore jerseys. And so I got in my car, and I was rolling, right? And so I was driving down the road, and I was listening to Ludacris. No, but then I was driving, and, and I got to this place, and they were selling me this Xbox, and I was so excited. So at the time, they didn't have a TV. They didn't have anything I could plug it in and test it with. So I went, and I gave them the money. Hey, is everything good? I was looking at, oh, yeah, man, it's great. The system's great. I'm like, are you sure? Oh, yeah, for sure, man. And I went home. I plugged it in. I played for the most beautiful four hours of my life. And then I saw what's called the three rings of death. Yes, the three rings of death. And it means your Xbox is done. (laughs) And I was irate. Okay, I did the whole, like, this is a very strategic, mechanical move where you take the Xbox and you punch it and hope that it works. Okay, and so I did the whole punch, and then I did the high kick, like, the boot into it, and um, nothing worked. And I I thought that would fix it. It didn't. So then I raged. And then I called Microsoft, and they said, hey, we can't do anything for you. And so I just spent all this money on the system, went an hour and a half away, tried to reach out to the people I bought it from. Of course, they were not reaching back out to me. It was even a camouflage 360. Who, who has a camouflage Xbox 360? So I was like, I don't even like camo. So then I have this system sitting there. And it crashed, and I spent all this money because I wanted it so bad. And, and I thought about this. For some reason, this is the story that came to mind when thinking about this sermon. And, and it comes up to this one question. What happens? What happens when what catches your eye leads you into a bad situation? What happens when what catches your eye leads you into a bad situation. And that came to mind because I became fixated on getting myself an Xbox 360 and no one was going to stop me. And it led to a place where I'd saved up. I, I I didn't grow up in a family that had a lot of money that would pay for those things for me. And I did all these things so I could get one, and and then it crashed, and it made me upset. It was all because I was so focused on that. And I can think of a couple relationship stories, too. And and I'm going to be honest with you guys about some of my failed relationship stories, but I think about that story, and I think about our relationships, and, and how some of us, we become so focused on something we want. It catches our eye. And even if people are speaking into our ears, we still continue to go down that road and it turns into a bad situation. We see that story in the word of God. This is the story of Samson. 
It's actually in Judges chapter 14. If you guys want to turn there, it's in the Old Testament. This dude, Samson, considered the strongest man in the Bible. And I'm going to share his story. So Judges chapter 14, we'll be starting off in verse 1. And we're going to put it up on the screen as well for you guys to read. There it is. One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and mother objected. Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites you could marry, they asked. Why must we go to the pagan Philistines and find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. <laughs> okay? So what's happening here? We got this guy Samson, and he's a judge, and that essentially means that he's a guy who God has given his very spirit to, to protect the Israelites. And there's this neighboring nation called the Philistines. And the Philistines, they came uh, from in the islands in the Mediterranean Sea, and they ended up camping out uh, on, the, on the coastline and south of the Israelites, and, and they started infiltrating through the culture. And God said, hey, um, you are going to be, if you, if you are one of my people, I want you to be with an Israelite. Which, uh, to us, it sounds like, hey, if you're a Christian, date a Christian. And, and so he said, you can be with people, but don't be with the pagan nation of the Philistines. Pagan means uh, anyone who is not of God. Is not of God. And so he said, hey, that girl caught my eye. Hey, Dad, I want to be with her. Can, can you set that up? And the dad was begging him, don't take this route. Don't do this. You, can't you pick someone else? Don't be with this woman. And he said, no, get her for me. I want to be with this woman. And so I think about parents and, uh, <laughs> you know, some of us were like, oh, our parents don't know anything and, and they don't understand what I'm going through and, and they don't know the connection we have. Sometimes parents do see things that we don't see. And in this case, they saw something that Samson could not see. But he wanted her, and it all started because she caught his eye. When she caught his eye, he became fixated on her. He wanted to be with her. Bottom line, what you, will, what you consider, you will consume. And he started to consider this person. And what it did is it started to affect his life. And we're going to be sharing stories about this. But Delilah ended up being the downfall of Samson. Spoiler alert. And, and she ended up leading him down a path that led to destruction with his friends, with his people, and eventually his life. He even got his eyes gouged out. I know that's pretty extreme. But he even died a painful death because he continued to give in to this relationship. And so I think about us, we might not die, we might not have our eyes gouged out, but I have seen so many times over the years how a bad relationship affects a person. I always tell people, every single year, you want to take the highway to spiritual destruction in your faith, get in a bad relationship. That's the fastest path I've seen for someone who is on fire for God to be far from God. And it's a bad relationship. People say, hey, what is the biggest effect? What is this? Is it mental health? Is it COVID? Is this? I said, dude, it's a bad relationship. It is a bad relationship. And, and if we are honest, either we've been that person in that relationship or we've witnessed it. Can I get some feedback? <laughs> yes. We've been there. We've been there. I've been there. I have been the bad person in a relationship. I know both sides of it. But God has a specific calling for us and what it looks like to have a godly relationship. 
And so how do we protect ourselves? This first week, I want to talk about how, you know, that first thought, right? Like, it, it started, all this stuff started with something catching his eye. And so how do we protect ourselves? Because if we're walking around like this, like, like it, there's, we're not going to be gazing at something. We're, we're not going to be fixated on it. It started with, with something happening with his vision. And so how do we protect ourselves? First thing, guard your eye. Guard your eye. This is what scripture says in Proverbs 7, 1 through 5. And look at this. Follow my advice, my son. Always treasure my commands. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Tie them on your fingers as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight a beloved member of your family. Let them protect you from an affair with an immoral woman, from listening to the flattery of a promiscuous woman. And so what this is saying here is he's trying, it's an image of a father giving a son advice. And it's a father to, to a daughter or son just, hey, protect your vision. I was reading this this week. This is Science Daily. This is what it says. We are almost constantly surrounded by a variety of vis visual objects, all of which could theoretically be important to us. But only a very small area of our retinas, the fovea in the macula lutea, okay, I messed that up, but it's close enough, has high visual accuracy. A large portion of our field of vision has only a low resolution. So what, does it, what this is saying is, I can see the whole room right now. But if I'm looking right up here at Megan, I can still see the whole room. But I'm seeing her with complete accuracy. It's uncomfortable, sorry. <laughs> what it's saying is, you can see it's just a lower resolution the further out you get. And so our eyes, our retinas can only concentrate on a specific area with high resolution at a time. It goes on to say this, therefore our gaze must be directed towards a specific target in order to precisely identify the object. We choose what we look at. We choose what we focus on. And once we focus on that thing, it starts to infiltrate our brain. As a young man, young woman, we decide to do something with it. And so it starts, this might be crazy, you may ever, have never thought about this before. It starts with our eyes. And what we allow to go in our mind. And so some of us, Let's get real, we choose to fixate on the wrong things. 95% of men will have seen a pornographic image before they turn 18. The average age of a male that sees a pornographic image is nine. They say 80% of men right now below the age of 18 look at pornographic images on a weekly basis. And guess what, ladies? You guys used to be my saving grace. You're growing at a rapid pace. I remember preaching this kind of sermon 10 years ago and be like, ladies, you're only down here. Guys, you're sick. And now the girls are growing dramatically in this area. They say over 50% now of young ladies. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. And what we choose to do with those things directly affect our relationship with God. And if we don't think it does, then man, we are, we're missing the mark. Have I done those things? Have I struggled in those things? Have I had to put up guardrails? Absolutely. I'm a human. But each day we have a choice. Are we going to be different? What will we fix our gaze on? First thing to protect ourselves, guard these. What you look at will affect you. Guys or boys, we need men. We need people to step up. 
We need people to go above and beyond. I'm tired of boys. We need men. Treat women with respect. Honor them. Honor them. Honor them. Please honor them. Women, be respectable. Don't expect. Don't expect a male to want to be with you who's God-fearing if you're attracting and setting yourself up to attract a specific kind of individual. How you act, how you dress, how you appear, the words you say will attract a kind of person. And if you're only attracting scumbags, it's because there's something that you are doing that is attracting them to you. And I'm not going to fill in that blank. But really look into your heart and ask the hard questions. We don't need girls, we need women. It's time that we are different. And if we can't be different within the church, how do we expect to change the world? How do we expect to? If we can't figure it out here, the world is going to be no different. Guard your eyes. Guard your eyes. Be different. Be different, please. Second thing, and this is, this is practical. Guard your eyes. Second thing, what I call filters and friends. Filters and friends. Guys, there is powerful, powerful um, Things online that could protect us from, from struggling in those areas. One of my best friends in the world, he's a pastor. He's actually a lead pastor of a church. Every website he goes to, if it comes up and reads up explicit in any way, it will send an email to his wife and his father-in-law. He said, Winston, I, I don't want to struggle with pornography, and so I'm going to send it to the last two people on the planet that I want to see it. And so his wife and his father-in-law are the ones who see what he looks at. Guys, there's a powerful tool out there. There are things out there that can help in this area. If it's putting a filter on, on a phone or on a computer, do it. And friends, get someone who's accountable. Get someone who can be accountable to you. There is power in preventative work through filters, and there's power through friends who you can confess to. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's power in going to someone and be like, yo, man, I, I am, I'm struggling in this. I am, I am struggling in this area. I'm struggling with my girlfriend right now. I'm struggling with my boyfriend. I'm struggling with what I'm looking at. Guys, friends are another filter system that help you and can keep you accountable. I love the last part of that verse. It says this, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. If you have a friend you go to and you say, hey, I'm struggling in this area, and you guys stop and you pray together, I believe that God will honor those prayers. He will work with you. He is a God of grace, and he wants you to get through whatever it is you're struggling with. The third thing is uh, meditate in your heart. And the reason I said this, and you might, okay, meditate, do I sit down on the ground like this? And it's because it's about time with God, spending time with his word and listening to it. Hebrews 4.12 says this. It's a beautiful scripture. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. I've battled with that as a believer, knowing that I was struggling in a sexual sin. I've been in a place where I've struggled in this area, and the word of God pierced my heart. And I was like, man, this is not right. God, this is not right. I know. And I just heard his whispers, I love you. We're going to get through this. But guys, it cut. <laughs> it cut my heart. It cut my heart that those were things that I wasn't honoring God with. And if we're honest, it probably is cutting some of us. It's been plaguing people since the beginning of time. 
And I know we're not talking directly about um, the beautiful aspect of, of sex. We're talking about the struggle of it before um, marriage and even the lust part of it. But we got to be people of the word. We got to have his word in our life. We got to meditate on it. We got to study it. We got to see what God says, not what Cardi B says. <laughs> guys, I, I, I've been saying this because a lot of you guys know I love rap. Like, I love rap. But there's some artists out there that give the exact wrong image of what it looks like to be in a relationship. It's filthy. It's, it's funny, and this is rant. We live in cancel culture. We'll cancel someone for making one statement, but then we'll praise um, these, these artists for, for womenizing people and saying all the girls that they sleep with and all the guys that they sleep with. And we idolize them when they are the worst examples in the world. And the word of God makes it clear that we are supposed to honor our bodies, honor people, treat them right. And we as a church got to be different. We have to be different. So you think about this. Um, I've had so many stories, guys. I, I, I could share story after story of student relationship. And I was thinking this week about one. It was this young girl, and, and she liked this guy. And he was, he was charismatic. He was a cool guy. He was athletic. But he didn't love Jesus. And, and he didn't have a moral compass like she did. And she's like, I just really think I can change him. I think this is good. And he was a cool guy. He was. I did enjoy, you know, getting to know him, but I told her point blank. I said, listen, I'm not saying down the road, but I don't think it's in your best interest right now if you are with this person. And she listened to me in the beginning. Then a couple weeks down the road, I heard that they had started dating. Uh, and, you know, I'm an optimist. I'm like, okay, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe it can turn around. And then there's this process, right? And, and I've told people for years that um, you know, I could tell in any relationship when, when something sexual starts happening. Because people change. People really do change. It's, some of us, we, we might think that we're, we're cryptic and secretive, but I think it's very obvious she started to change. Her whole demeanor, even in a worship setting, how she approached God was so different. Instead of looking up, she looked down. Instead of hand raised, they were in the pocket. Instead of the front row, she was in the dark in the back. Her smile turned into an indifferent frown. And she started to change. And I remember uh, being with her after he broke her heart and her crying and thinking there was no hope, tissues in hand wailing, barely breathing because she was hyperventilating. And I remember looking in her eyes and saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You will live to see another day. God loves you and he will heal you. But after counseling, medication, therapy, It got harder. And she got in another relationship. She didn't make the proper changes that she needed to do, and the cycle continued. Have you guys ever met someone like that? Have you ever been that person? She continued the cycle. And I would love to be up here today and say, guys, now she found this amazing Christian man and they're married. And the cycle continues. And I can think back to the moment where there was a chance for her to change the tra trajectory of her life. And she chose not to. Make the right decision. Be preventative. Protect your eyes. Protect your heart. Get accountability partner and, and a filter and, and meditate, spend time with God. Do preventative work. And I believe God will bless your relationship. Your relationships, either you're in or you're going to be. Guys, I'm so excited for the next three weeks. This is just the beginning. Might even have a couple more music videos for you. 
<laughs> I heard a, uh, yes. I'm going to pray for us, then we're going to break off into groups. And then I have one quick announcement afterwards. God, thank you so, so much that we could be in this room and talk about something we don't get to talk about that often. I pray that uh, for the boys in the room, they, they, they grow up, they become men. Men of steel, men of honor. Ready to take the path that's least traveled to honor a woman. I pray for women that they don't need to, to dress a certain way, act a certain way, to attract a certain type of person. That they can be who they are in you and that's enough. And the right people will find them and they will find them as well. God, let us guard our, guard our eyes, guard our hearts. Let's not take the path of Samson fixating our eyes on something that takes us down the wrong path. We love you so much, Jesus. Thank you for this night. And we pray this all in your name and all God's people said, amen.